In this video, we're going to go through our demonstration of our Disney earnings model. Please keep in mind that this video was created prior to the fiscal fourth quarter 2015 earnings release and that these values will update when the company releases new information. So please check our website, gutenbergresearch.com, for the latest updates. The structure of our, of our model here is consistent with our other companies. In the upper left hand corner we have our color legend which indicates any place that you see a blue cell, those represent our estimates. Purple cells represent company guidance if it's given, and orange cells represent consensus estimates. Below that we have a quick summary of our final share valuation, so our 12 month target value based on a price earnings ratio based on a discounted cash flow approach and based on a 50% weighting of those two. Below that is the income statement. And then we have a segment details, balance sheet, cash flow statement, multiple valuation section, and a discounted valuation section. So if we collapse those and move back up to the income statement, you can also see that we have some columns shaded in dark gray. Those represent the historic values, and those are come from the company's um, SEC filings. And then the light gray represents estimates for future periods. So from there, we can freeze the cells and start working through. So how do we build the income statement? Well, what we do is we divide out the segment details, and Disney has a number of segments. So you'll see down here you have cable network segment, broadcasting, parks and resorts, studio, consumer, interactive, and then from there we have some um, ratios and non-gap adjustment details. So if we take uh, the first one, cable network segment, you can see each one of these are calculated the same way, so we'll just start with one. Um, the total revenue for cable networks is based on a growth rate, so we apply a quarter over quarter growth rate to come back to the total revenue for networks. Um, then we apply a operating income margin to that revenue number to come back to our operating income. And then we have the capex um, as a percentage of net income, or I'm sorry, as a percentage of revenue and depreciation also as a percentage of revenue. So once we do that for each one of these segments, we can get back to the total income statement, which we'll go through now. So our total revenue line item is simply the sum of the services and the products. Now, the breakdown between service and products is a little bit more difficult uh, to do on a segment basis. So what we do is we take our total sum of the revenue for the segments and then we just apply a simple percentage that we've seen um, in the historic results. So we've, we've seen about 80% of the revenue coming from services and about 20% from products and that's what you see up here. So obviously some of the segments are, are not going to have that, that split. Um, in fact some don't even have the products but that's just a simplistic approach here. So you can see up here in the revenue line item that we've got the sum of everything that we have going on in our segment details. We have a, the cable network revenue, broadcasting revenue, um, revenue, parks and resorts revenue, studio entertainment revenue, consumer products revenue, and interactive revenue. And that gets us to our total revenue up in the income statement. Then for the cost of services, you can see that we're applying a gross margin percentage and we're also doing that for the products. And that gets us to our total cost of revenue and our total gross profit. Then we have our operating expense line items, so SG&A and depreciation and amortization. And that is based on our breakdown of total segment operating expenses down in row 95. So you can see that that's just taking the operating margin in each one of the segments, applying it to the revenue, and then subtracting it out to back into what the operating expenses are. So that gets us to our operating income 
Uh, we have a section for other income and expenses, interest income, which is right here, and then equity in income of investees, which we're essentially just setting equal to last quarter's um, equity and income of investees. Gets us to our income before taxes. We apply an effective tax rate to that to come to our net income on a gap basis. And then if we have any non-gap adjustments, we would put them in there. Once we divide out our total income, net income, by the shares outstanding, we get back to our uh, diluted EPS. So you can see that our model is con uh, configured to meet the consensus estimates for the top line and bottom line earnings numbers for the next 12 months and also for 2016 full fiscal year. So now that you have an understanding for how the model is built, you could think about how you might want to use it to project out what uh, the earnings could be under some different scenarios. So let's go to the cable networks. Maybe you think that there'll be a severe impact of this trend of un unbundling, which would could potentially impact Disney. So maybe you think, okay, over the next um, next four quarters or next five quarters even, that there's going to be some significant impact. So what if we saw a 20% decline in revenue from cable networks? And now as we do this, take a look at our implied average price target per share. So right now we're at $105 per share. So what happens if we do, I don't know, maybe 10% uh, decline, 10% decline, 10% decline, So you can see we went from $105 per share down to $92 per share. And you could also see what impact it had on the EPS as we did that. For now, I'll undo that. But it's a good demonstration on how important it is to model out earnings, because you can see pretty quickly um, what kind of impact it would have on the share valuation. And you could also do a similar type of approach to any of these metrics. Um, and then when you get down to the valuation sections, there are also some additional things that you could change. For the multiple that we apply to the earnings, what we're essentially doing here is we take the average close price. So we take the close price at the end of the day for each day in the last three months. And we subtract from that the net cash. In this case, Disney actually has a net debt balance per share. And then we divide that by the consensus EPS estimate for the next 12 months. So that gets us to a 12-month average of about 21 times earnings, next, next 12 month earnings, a high of 23 times, and a low of 18 times. And we apply the average here. So then if you click on the valuation cell, you can see all we're doing is taking the EPS from our income statement for the next four quarters. So here, 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 and here. We're adding that together. We're multiplying it by the um, price earnings ratio, and we are subtracting out the net debt per share. Now, for the discounted cash flow valuation, it's a bit more complex. First, what we have to do is calculate the weighted average cost of capital, which is based on the weight of debt times the cost of debt plus the weight of equity times the cost of equity. And we're using that discount rate um, for each one of the five cash flows in our stage one, which is the next five year period. And then we're also using it in the, in the discount rate for the terminal value, um, which is essentially a perpetuity equation. If you'd like additional details on how this works, please visit our website, gutenbergresearch.com, or our YouTube channel where we have a video describing that process. And if you'd like to download this model, please visit our website, click on the model store, scroll down to Disney, and click the Buy It Now button. Thanks for watching.